Good night, mate. 40 here. Listening to Richard Spence's conversation with his philosopher David Scarbina. Intruders threw them out of power, probably pilfered their temples, you know, and extracted taxes and tributes and so forth. So he's talking about when the Romans took control of, of Palestine, they took, they stole, they murdered, they raped. Right, so in the Gospels, the Romans are these kind of shadowy figures, right? Even though they're the ones who are actually running things in the first century of Palestine at the time of Jesus. Yeah, obviously a lot of resentment, a lot of anger there by the people who were in charge, which was the, the various Jewish tribes. Um, the people who were there. You think? You know, normally people are excited to be invaded and conquered and have, you know, foreigners ruling them. Really? Yeah, so the kingdom of heaven, from a Jewish perspective, 2,000 years ago, it meant self-rule, right? Jews in control of their own destiny, right? It wasn't an otherworldly thing. It wasn't, you know, salvation to another world. It was about salvation in this world, away from the barbaric Romans and their cruel regime. So yeah, there are many different Jewish responses to the Romans, right? Some just tried to make the best of things, right? Just uh, accede to the power. Another approach was like revolution and assassination, right? So many different Jewish approaches 2,000 years ago. There are many different Jewish sects. There were the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the uh, Zealots, the assassins. Kind of, you know, renegade killers trying to uh, assassinate individual Romans as a way to uh, attack them, you know, to, to, to get back at them, okay? Of course, you're facing the largest military in the world, so you have uh, limited options at that point. But obviously, individual small-scale attacks were working, so there was a movement on the foot there. Um, but I, I sort of speculated, you know, the intellectuals like, like Paul, who was an intellectual, he was, you know, well-educated elite uh, Jew, and, you know, he would likely have known that, hey, this little stabbings and killings was probably not going to really do it in the long run. And so, Paul had a tremendous imagination. There's no evidence that he was much of a scholar, no evidence that he could even read the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew. So he was not a scholar of things Jewish. His claims about having studied Rabban Gamliel are lies, because to study with Rabban Gamliel you'd have to speak Hebrew. There's all evidence we have is that uh, Paul could not speak Hebrew. Like he, he was relying upon Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh what Christians called the Old Testament. So from everything we know, Paul didn't speak Hebrew. Paul, I think, was from Tiberias. There were no Jewish academies there. All right, so he was Jewishly ignorant, but had a superficial understanding of the Hebrew Bible gained through the Greek translation Septuagint. And he had ambition and imagination. And we have to think sort of harder and deeper about how we can go about really undermining the basis for the Romans. We can't just kill them off one by one, that'll take centuries. So we, we need to try something else. We need to try to attack their basic picture of the world, the structure of their belief system, their, their, you know, the moral basis for the worldview. And, and, and it is, you... Okay, I don't think it holds up to see the Apostle Paul as being primarily motivated by trying to take down the Romans. And there isn't a lot of anti-Roman sentiment in the Apostle Paul. There's some, but there's plenty of render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Uh, there's some uh, anti-Jewish sentiment. You can imagine, I'm thinking, like, maybe that will work on, at least on the masses, if not the Romans themselves, if we can at least start to get the masses away from the Romans and towards, on our side, a little bit more towards our side. Right, so it's not unknown that a person with an above average intelligence such as Paul will sell something to the masses that uh, he thinks will get the masses moving in a direction he likes. So see the same kind of phenomenon with Donald Trump. He's the great pro whisperer. You know, he knows how to speak to the 95 IQ crowd, like uh, almost no other politician in, in the last 20 years. Then we might sort of really undermine the common support for Rome. We might sort of get, the, get kind of sympathy in some sense from the masses, and maybe that will happen, 
And I really kind of think that was sort of the real insight. I mean, it was a kind of brilliant insight that Paul, who, who was by consensus the first writer, the first Christian writer, his letters are the first documents of Christian history. So he must have been the first uh, to, to kind of concoct this idea that he envisions this very skeletal structure of a theology. It's very bare bones. You really see nothing of the detail in the letters of Paul. All the details come later in the Gospels, and those don't appear until Paul's gone. Right. So he either knows nothing about them or he had nothing to do. Yeah, Paul was not a systematic thinker. He was not a systematic theologian. Right. He was someone with a tremendous imagination. What we'll do with that, we don't really know for sure. But, but, but Paul, can, we can imagine, constructed a bare bones theology about a God who came to earth. He's here for you. He sacrificed himself for you. He got crucified. He got ra raised from the dead. And you too can do that if you believe in us. Don't believe in those Romans. You can believe me. You can believe in our new story about this rabbi, this rabbi Jesus from Nazareth. And then and there's great benefits. Yeah. So, you know, that was a kind of an interesting little story that you can imagine. Paul constructs and he's ready to promote that among, among the masses. Yeah, I, I would I would want to stress this because th this is something that I, I think I would suggest that most average Christians actually don't know, which is that Paul never read the Gospels. Yeah, right. If you understand your religion, you're not really religious. So, of course, most people don't have you know, a profound understanding of their own religion. It just, just happens to be the social club that they were raised in. Well, these weren't sects of Christianity. They were sects of the, the Jesus movement. There wasn't really a Christianity in the first century. That's, that's wrong. That's heretical. This is, this is the right one. Um, uh, so he, he's a kind of movement organizer is the best way of describing him. And, but, but there's the other thing that, had, had, that, I would, that I would stress is that Paul found Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, so you know, again, he, there's the story of the you know trip to Damascus and an epiphany and so on. But he's he, he never met the historical figure Jesus. If, if he existed, he kind of found him in the text. And so um, Christianity is profoundly Jewish in that sense. Uh, it, it isn't. It, it, there isn't. Okay, Christianity isn't profoundly Jewish because Paul was able to read Jesus into the text of the Hebrew Bible any more than Buddhism would be profoundly forty. Just because I'm able to say read the sacred text of Buddhism and see myself foretold there. Islam is not profoundly 40 if I can read the Quran and see myself prophesied there. Right? Your ability to read your imagination right, into some ancient text doesn't mean that it's really there in the text. You know, right? It doesn't make uh, Christianity profoundly Jewish. It isn't like you know God you know chose the Jews for a time and then he just created this whole new thing. You know, it has nothing to do with the, the Old Testament. No, um, the the myth of Jesus and even the story of Jesus emerged from the Old Testament. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't important differences, but of course there are. But it, it is profoundly Jewish in its inception. No, that doesn't make it profoundly Jewish. All right, there are claims. All right, wanting to to take on the mantle of things Jewish, but uh, reading. You know, reading Jesus into the Hebrew Bible doesn't make Christianity profoundly Jewish. Absolutely. I mean, that, that was the milieu, that was the context in which everything emerged. I mean, you know, the Paul is an elite educated Jew. I mean, he's, he's going to think in a Jewish term like Jews do today. I mean, it hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Uh, Paul was not educated Jewishly. He couldn't even read Hebrew. He was, there's absolutely no basis to believe that he was literate in Hebrew. All evidence shows that he couldn't read Hebrew ago. He was a Jewishly ignorant Jew. He didn't know the Hebrew Bible. He relied on a Hebrew translation. Just shows you how ignorant he was. The, uh, you know, the, 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 the Jewish Bible, that was an obvious thing. So he's going to clearly draw from those morals and fables as best he can. Um, he wants to construct a Jewish-friendly theology as much as possible because that's the objective. Um, but uh, but I, I suspect, and I, this is where I, I differ with some of the mythicists, I think there probably was an actual person. I think there was an actual guy, an actual rabbi. Maybe he was called Jesus, maybe he was from Nazareth, I, I, we don't know. Probably he was agitating on behalf of the poor and the impoverished against the Romans. He might have been sort of a political agitator, you know, and, and trying to drive those invaders out and so forth. He probably had a, you know, kind of a little bit of a moral backbone there, was opposing the Romans. And if, if you got visible enough and you caused enough stir, then the Romans strung you up on a, on a cross and they crucified you, and that was a punishment, the Roman punishment for political agitators. So I can imagine all that probably, probably actually happened. Probably was a Jesus, agitated, got crucified, and then a few years later, uh, Paul comes along, and maybe he's drawing from this actual story. Again, this is sort of my speculation, but of course, it's obvious. If you want to construct a hoax to deceive people, 
it's always best to include as much truth in it as you can. Sure. Because, because it's going to sound more, more bearable, uh, verifiable. It's going to sound more is, is true. Right? If anybody checks anything, yeah, there actually was that Jesus guy. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah, he was a great guy. He was a great teacher. Okay, he really did exist. So it, it makes sense that Paul would have drawn from an actual person, life and probably death, and then gone back to the Old Testament and drew bits and pieces that kind of seemed to mesh with that story. Uh, you know, from what I've seen, it's very, it's typically biblical. It's very cryptic sort of stuff. When you look at people say, oh, the Old Testament anticipated Jesus coming. Well, look at this very obscure sort of passages. And say, well, that sounds a little... Yeah, you'd have to, you can read anything you want into a text, including the Hebrew Bible. So that's eisegesis, when you read a meaning into the text. Exegesis is when you deduce a meaning from the text. So Christianity is engaged in eisegesis, not exegesis. It's a little bit like this, and that could be interpreted as this. And I, you, you know, okay, that's very useful when you want to make a story. So I can imagine that Paul did that. He put the little bits and pieces, maybe not even maybe more even the gospel writers than Paul himself. But he could have, even Paul could have taken little elements of the Old Testament and, and matched it to this guy's life and then started to use that to build this, you know, the three days. People talk about the three days in the cave. Well, it sounds like three days, you know, Noah's three days in the whale. Mm -hmm. You know, these kinds of things. So you can, you can sort of construct parallels that were there in the Old Testament and sort of weave. Yeah, and you can do all that from a translation. You don't need to know the Hebrew to come up with these imaginative roaming. Weave those into the life of someone who, was, who existed and make a kind of an interesting and compelling new story. Right, and in Daniel, there, there is the image of a, a suffering Christ, a suffering Messiah, which I, I think would go against other versions of the Messiah who, who would be more David-like, that they would be a warrior king who would come out of nowhere and start kicking ass. Okay, the notion of some suffering Messiah who takes the world's sins upon his shoulders is unknown in Judaism. Yes. Obviously, that Jesus doesn't do that at all, but again, there is very strong precedent. I mean, and the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 refers to the Jewish people. Right, it refers to Israel, it doesn't refer to an individual. I mean, I, I've been exposed also to, to, to Daniel um, in the sense of uh, many, particularly Protestant Christians, will say, you know, this is the text that the Jews don't want, don't want to know about because this just... Let me just fast they, forward they, through they, this nonsense. Of course, that was a very hard sell at the time because the Jews were just crushed. I mean, the Romans rolled in and boom, they're, you know, they're yeah. just... Yeah, it was a hard sell then. It was a hard sell 100 years later. It was a hard sell 200 years later. Like Jews who know anything about Judaism and the Hebrew Bible just simply don't buy the claims of Christianity. They don't buy the claims made for, for Jesus. Right? Only Jewishly ignorant Jews can buy into this because it's completely repellent from a Jewish perspective. The idea of this cannibalistic ritual sacrifice where you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the God that's been sent to earth to die on a cross, right? this is all repellent from a Jewish perspective. So, so you, you, you were hard pressed to look for a warrior king who was going to save you at that point. It was a lot easier to find the suffering victim. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Jews have never looked for a Messiah who's a suffering victim. Right. First of all, the doctrine of the Messiah plays very little importance in the way that Jews lead their lives. Right. It's an esoteric you know, piece of uh, storytelling that uh, doesn't have much practical significance. And then, to the extent it does have a significance, it's ever some individual suffering for the world's sins. The suffering victim who took a moral position, got himself killed, and now he's, you know, beloved of God because he was such a great guy. That's a whole lot easier story to sell at the time that Paul is, you know, constructing his, his, his theme. Yeah, it was an easier story to sell to Gentiles. Not an easy story to sell to Jews. Jews are a tough audience. You ever spoken to a group of Jews, uh, you know that they're kind of feisty. Uh, and have one very nice Protestant friend who had a lot of Jews at her event. Like right in the middle of her talk, someone stood up and said, you know, some Jews stood up and said, I've never heard such nonsense, you know, my whole life. Like, Jews, Jews are a tough audience. They, they don't uh, just sit back and passively buy into things. So yeah, it makes sense. Paul must have known both sides. He would have known about the warrior king side and sort of the suffering savior. And he's like, all right, I'll take, I'll take that suffering savior because I can match that to the guy who got crucified a couple years ago and I can make a good story out of that. So, do you yeah, that wouldn't sell to Jews. That would sell to more credulous non-Jews. Do you, do you think that Paul's motivation, motivations were ideological in the sense, and in some ways cryptic in the sense that he was trying to create this ideology that would undermine the Roman ideology and, and many ideologies of uh, Paul had a tremendous imagination, right? He had a gift with words. He had a high verbal IQ. I don't think you need to go deeper than that.